morning, boys and girls. Good morning. Is it fun coming up for a children's story? You don't know. Okay, well, we'll see what you think. Um, so let me ask you a question. Um, how many of you have seen something like this here, what I'm holding? A marker. What are these? So what is this? Okay, different kinds of markers? Yes. So in my house, we have two young, beautiful kids. And sometimes you're okay when you see this, the marker. You're okay when you see this, kids playing with this. You're not always okay when you see these lying around. Why is that? The green one is a washable marker, so if you get it on stuff, you can wash it away. But the blue one's a permanent marker, which means it stays there forever. The blue one is permanent, and that means that what you do is it stays forever. Nobody knows how to do anything with it. It will eventually come off. Eventually, you think it'll come off. You know this from experience. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So, but for, the, for, for most people, Permanent markers are scary. Because if I come up to you, he has a beautiful white shirt. If I took this and I marked up your shirt, it wouldn't be beautiful anymore, would it? I don't know. So I'm going to hand you all a piece of paper, OK? Now you ho and we're going to do a demonstration. You ready? All right. I'll hand this to you. that you hold that you hold that you hold that you hold that okay you hold that you hold that okay now here's the question <laughs> oh <laughs> Florentine okay so how much money do you have in your hand are you sure? Yes. How do you know that, that that is worth as much as it says it's worth? Oh. The number on the bill. The number on the bill, she says, is the number two. For some of you, it might be a one. <laughs> but, but for most of you, the number is a two. So if you have a two on, your, on that bill and you walk into the store and the store says that whatever you want to buy is going to be $2, can you buy it? Yes. Okay, so what's your name again, sweetie? Audrey. Audrey, okay, Audrey, can I have this? Now this is Audrey's dollar bill. If I take Audrey's dollar bill, Is it still worth two dollars? You sure? Still worth two dollars? The store will take it. Can I have your t this here? Okay. If I put a one here. Is it still worth $2? If I mark it up like that, can you still take it to the store? Is it still valuable? Oh, you don't think they'll take it. It's a good question. Guess what? God thinks you are all valuable. He thinks you're worth everything. 
And when I was a kid, they used to make us memorize this verse in the Bible. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever shall believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. That means God is saying that you are valuable, valuable, valuable. And even if the world crumples you up, God says, you're still valuable. Even if the world rips you up, rips you apart, you're still what? Valuable. Even if the world marks you up, are you still what? Because God said, I'm going to empty everything in heaven. I'm going to send my only son, and he's going to die just for you. If you were the only person on the earth who needed someone to die for them, Jesus would die just for you. So today, we celebrate what's called the resurrection. Because not only did Jesus die for us, but he rose up from the grave. Just for us. Is that cool? Is that not super cool? Listen. All week, try to repeat that. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. I am valuable to God. That, that I, I threw that last part. <laughs> All right. Anyone want to pray? Want to say a prayer? Just thank you for the Sabbath and then the stay Lord. Thanks for this children's story and help us to know that we are valuable no matter what and help us to follow in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. All right, you go to your seats. Our next song is in the He Is Our Song handbook and it's number 52, number 52, Emmanuel. going to begin our Passion Resurrection Meditation part of the service. I would like to invite um, any members of the choir who are still straggling uh, to come up to the choir loft now, if you're downstairs or upstairs, and the other participants of the program uh, to come forward. We will be doing a series of hymns, of songs, intermixed with readings for this part of our service. And we just ask that you would ask God for a special blessing, a special outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon you as you listen to these, um, and that you pray for us. Um, because even though we have all practiced, we're still human beings, and uh, we just want to serve God and praise him today, together with you. Amen.
Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. To the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us and the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavishes on us with all wisdom and understanding, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen and amen.
as time for the Passover supper neared, Jesus asked his disciples to go to a certain upper room in Jerusalem and prepare for that event. They all met together that Thursday evening to eat the Passover meal together. The disciples were ill at ease with each other, contending for the highest place in what they thought would be Christ's coming kingdom. No one was there to wash their feet, so Jesus himself stooped to do this menial task. After the meal, Jesus broke bread and gave it to each disciple as a representation of his body that would be broken the next day. After he gave them bread, he blessed the cup of grape juice and gave it to each of them as a, as a representation of his blood that would be shed. They sang a hymn and then together, by the light of a full moon, they went out of the city across the Kidron Valley and up the Garden of Gethsemane. On the way, Jesus encouraged them to trust God and to, and to not let their hearts be troubled. But as they neared Gethsemane, Jesus became very sad and distressed. The sins of the whole world were being laid on him, and it was crushing out his life. Asking his disciples to pray for him, he went to his favorite place of prayer and fell on his face, begging God to remove the cup of suffering if possible. Three times he asked his disciples to pray for him, but they always fell asleep. And three times he went to his place of prayer to beg God for release. His agony was so great that he shed great drops of blood. The sins of the whole world were crushing out his life. At last, the father sent an angel to strengthen and encourage Jesus to go through with the plan so that through his sacrifice, all those who chose to love and serve him might be saved. At last, Jesus, strengthened by that angel, rose and went forth to meet his betrayer. Judas and a group of soldiers and priests met him at the entrance to the garden. They bound him and took him for a farce of a trial. Trials at night were illegal. But they took him to the court of Annas and Caiaphas, and there Jesus, constrained under oath to confess his deity, which the authorities considered blasphemy. They hoped to use that to condemn Jesus. But it was there that Peter denied Jesus and fled back to Gethsemane to weep in sorrow. When daylight dawned, the Sanhedrin held another trial. Once more under oath, he was mandated to confess his deity. At that point, the crowd went crazy and abused him and mocked him. If the Roman soldiers had not intervened, he would have been torn apart from the Sanhedrin. Jesus was sent to Pilate in the hope that Pilate, the Roman governor, would sentence him to death. Pilate examined Jesus and could find no fault in him. Jesus silently endured the abusive accusations. Pilate, finding no reason to punish Jesus, sent him to Herod, the Herod who had slain John the Baptist. Jesus refused to converse with Herod or perform a miracle at his request. All this enraged Herod. So he dressed Jesus in an old robe and the crown scorned and, and with a crown and scorned and mocked him and physically abused him, spit in his face, yanked him this way and that way until had it not been for the Roman soldiers intervening, he would have again been almost torn apart. Then Herod sent him back to Pilate. Pilate was not happy to have Jesus back. His wife had sent him a letter about a dream she had regarding Jesus and who he is. She advised him not to get involved in prosecuting Jesus, but Pilate was a weak character. He tried to quell the wrath of the priest and mob by releasing Barabbas, who was a criminal, and have Jesus scourged. But louder and louder, the mob cried out that Jesus be crucified. He was dressed in an old purple robe. A crown of thorns was placed on his head. A reed was put in his hand. He was scorned, reviled, ridiculed, abused, and cursed by the maddened, demon-inspired throng. They grabbed the reed from his hand and beat him on the head until the thorns pierced his scalp and blood ran down his face. They yanked out his beard and spit in his face. 
the Roman soldiers were appalled at the inhumane treatment that Jesus was given. Again, Pilate tried to appeal to human sympathies. He, st he stood Christ next to Barabbas and said, Behold, your king. But the Jews said, Away with him. Crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. So the weak and vacillating Pilate washed his hands before the crowd and said, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. And the Jews replied, his blood be on us and our children. Pilate then apologized to Jesus for what he was allowing to happen. He then had Jesus scourged for the second time. Then the soldiers led him away as the thunderous cries of the mob yelled, crucify him, crucify him through the streets of Jerusalem. Golgotha, the place of crucifixion, was located in a quarry wall at the north end of Jerusalem. Outside the gate were many crowds passed by on their way into the city. Jesus was weak from the scourgings and loss of blood. He fell, fainting beneath the cross on the way. A stranger was constrained to carry the cross for Jesus to Calvary. There he was bound 
and the cruel nails were pounded into his hands and feet. Then the cross was, filled, was lifted and roughly dropped into the hole prepared for it, causing great anguish to Jesus. As Jesus hung on that cross, stark naked, the priests and soldiers mocked and derided him. The Passover crowds passing by on their way into the city stopped and watched. Some sympathized and wept. Others joined in scorning him, for the sign above him said that he was 
quote unquote, the king of the Jews. Through it all, Jesus kept praying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He showed his forgiving love when he promised the repentant thief a home in paradise. He showed his loving selflessness when he put his mother in care of his disciple John. As the sins of the world were pressing the life out of Jesus, the emotional agony was so great that his physical pain was barely felt some of the time. The anguish of the hiding of his father's face was excruciating to him. He could not see through the portals of the tomb. On the cross, he had no hope of ever coming out of the tomb or of his father's acceptance. So great was his anguish that at noontime the sun refused to shine, seemed to be blotted out. God's presence was hiding, hiding in that darkness, but Jesus, in bearing the punishment for the sins of the world, knew it not. In that darkness, God veiled the last human agony of his son.
In the supernatural darkness, silence reigned at Calvary. Vivid lightnings occasionally flashed from the cloud and illuminated the Savior's dying form. Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? His sense of physical suffering returned, and he said he was thirsty. Suddenly, the gloom was lifted from the cross, and in clear trumpet-like tones, Jesus cried out, It is finished. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. A light encircled the cross, and the face of the Savior shone with a glory like the sun. He then bowed his head on his breast and died died of a broken heart. The sins of the whole world, yours and mine, broke his heart. But as he submitted and committed himself to God, the sense of the loss of his father's favor was withdrawn. By faith, he was victor. At Christ's expiring cry, darkness again settled down. A hoarse rumbling like heavy thunder was heard. There was a violent earthquake. Rocks were rent asunder. Creation seemed to be shivering to atoms. The people were shaken together in heaps. Priests, rulers, soldiers, executioners, and people mute with terror lay prostrate upon the ground. The temple veil was ripped from top to bottom by an unseen hand. The knife dropped from the priest's nerveless hand and the Passover lamb escaped. The most holy place of the earthly sanctuary was no longer sacred. The lamb of God had just given his life. Loving hands took Jesus' body down from the cross, wrapped it in fine linen with spices, and laid it in the tomb owned by Joseph of Arimathea. The tomb was in a garden close to Calvary. A huge stone was rolled in front of the door and sealed with a Roman seal. Roman soldiers were assigned to guard the tomb that no one might disturb it. The priest remembered that Jesus had said he would rise, and they were taking no chances. Jesus rested in the tomb from his work of redemption, just as he had rested that first Sabbath after his work of creating a perfect world. As the night of the first day of the week wore away, the Roman soldiers were still keeping their sleepless vigil. Evil angels were all around. Satan and his host 
were determined to keep the Lord Jesus forever in the grave. But holy angels that excel in strength were there as well, waiting to welcome the Prince of Life. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven. He was clothed with the panoply of God. The bright beams of God's glory went before him and illuminated his pathway. His countenance was like the lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and become as dead men. He rolls away the heavy stone from the door of the tomb as if it were a pebble and cries out, Son of God, come forth. Your father calls thee. The Roman soldiers see Jesus come forth from that tomb and hear him proclaim, I am the resurrection and the life. As he comes forth in majesty and glory, the, angels host, the angel hosts bow down low in adoration before him and welcome him with triumphant songs of joy and praise, saying, Thou hast vanquished the powers of Satan and darkness. Thou hast swallowed up death in victory. Thank you, choir. Thank you, Elder Moody, for those readings. Our Savior lives. That's what we proclaim, right? That last reading of that magnificence of that resurrection. Just think of that imagery for a moment. The guards standing, sitting on post nearby. The ground shaking, a bright light causing them to fall like dead men. An angel of the Lord coming down, rolling away the stone and calling forth Christ from the grave. What an image. Well, in my developmental years, there was a common phrase, uh, pick or it didn't happen. Uh, essentially, in, in previous generations, you could have some fantastical tale, some story that you would share and... Uh, we would either take you at, at your belief or, or your value for uh, how believable it might have been, the fish this large, you know, that idiom of, of uh, how fish the, uh, large the fish that you actually caught was. But now with the uh, availability of, of pictures and digital pictures to store numerous and increasing number uh, in the past few years, 
And you were able to record uh, the, the events of, of what's happening. And, and that became a, a measure of proof for what you had did and experienced in your life. Now, as technology has progressed, because uh, we, at that time, uh, several years ago, we thought, oh, well, it's, it's hard to duplicate an image. It's hard to uh, fabricate something uh, as, as complex as a picture. Well, as, as uh, Photoshop grew and, and skills developed, uh, pictures became less and less uh, reliable of a source. And I was like, oh, well, video. Sur surely video uh, is, is harder to duplicate. But with uh, recent technology, technological developments with uh, artificial intelligence and, and development, uh, nearly anything can be fabricated. And so when we think of, of an event like a resurrection 2,000 plus years ago, can we know it really happened? Can we know for sure that it is true? Well, I hope that we can look at some of the evidence and see that it is absolutely true. For what we first see here in the experience of what is happening, we have the evidence of an empty tomb, evidenced by the, the picture that we have on the screen. The, now, as we look at the empty tomb, sure, some skeptics could say, oh, well, the disciples stole the body and hid it elsewhere. But and that's exactly what the priests tried to convince the guards to say at risk of their jobs, their livelihoods, their lives even. But yet, they couldn't deny that the tomb was empty. The body of Jesus was not there. So much so that when, at the report, Peter and, and John ran to the tomb, go inside, and, and all they have found was the garments folded up where Jesus lay. The empty tomb. But we also have... The eyewitnesses. Just, just think of, of the first individuals that Jesus chose to reveal himself to first. The women of the group. Not Peter, not James, not John, the beloved disciples. The one he spent the most time with, the one that he was closest to. But the women of the group. To these women did the angels appear to share the good news. To say he is risen. To proclaim that message. If any other group, if any other uh, fabrication surely wouldn't have put women at the center of this good news story. But yet, each of the gospel writers do. They proclaim this. But then Jesus appears to them in the upper room on the road to, Dem uh, to Emmaus at the, along the Sea of Galilee. Eyewitnesses in multiple locations, in multiple events, becomes our second source of evidence. That this is true. That Jesus surely did rise from the, gra from the grave. And so with the combination of the empty tomb and, and Jesus appearing, it's, it's not a, a hoax, it's not a magic show. But it's something that could absolutely be true. That they themselves had seen as Jesus had eyewitnesses and appears. But there's also a reason for this story that this message is still being told today. Some will still try to find faults in the reasoning. But I challenge you to think of lies and conspiracies of the past. At some point, they were found out, whether they were one that you told your siblings or your parents, or a larger ploy of larger dimensions of governments and individuals and peoples. But they were all found out. And even the ones that were not how important are today? Are they remembered? Are they that significant? Do those continue on? I will argue that they were all forgotten if they were not found out. But there is something that is certainly not has been forgotten. The life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ and his name preached across the world. If it didn't happen, then why? The movement. Why the significance? Why is this message so powerful in our lives? So this resurrection, either it is a magnificent lie for reasons that we know this isn't the case, or perhaps there is truth 
in the description of the grace found in the resurrection that has been preserved and shared? And does this truth not give us hope? The Apostle Paul, as he is writing, one who did not experience the resurrection himself, only received through stories, writes many great words about the truth that is in Christ and what he has, what he has done. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you have received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. He's saying this message is true, and if it's not, then it's in vain. But it is not in vain, because it is true. And he goes on to explain, for what I have received, I pass on to you. As of the first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. That he was buried that he was raised on the third day according to those scriptures. And he continues on with more evidence as he goes through, as Jesus appears, the, the brothers, the sisters, to those who had came. This is the evidence. This is why we do not believe in vain, why what we believe is meaningful and important and part of our lives. To the Romans, he wrote that we are part of that experience through baptism. Romans 6, verse 4, we are therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, we too may have a new life. That is the hope. Yes, Jesus rose from the dead. Yes, he conquered the grave. Yes, he conquered death. For which he says a little bit later on, now, we believe, now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has a mastery over him. The death he died, the death to sin once for all. But for the life he lives, he lives to God. And he explains in many more ways throughout that book. But that is the core of our experience of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. To give us hope. To not just take away our sins, but so that we may live a new life in a new experience. This is our hope. And so because of the resurrection, we have hope of a relationship. With a God who loves us, who sent his son to die on the cross for us, that if anyone believes in him, they would be saved and have eternal life, an eternal relationship with him. They have no reason to fear death. John, the Revelator, the book of Revelation, chapter 21, offers a beautiful image of what we have to look forward to in a relationship to where death, crying, it doesn't exist. It's not needed. Light and darkness is totally different. For We don't need this sun, for the light of God is existing with us continually because we are in a relationship with God. So where sin had separated, Christ brought back together. And through that resurrection, we are given hope. So because of the resurrection, we live like today matters. Because of the resurrection, we have a Father that loves you. Because of the resurrection, you have a Savior that died for your sins. Because of the resurrection, you have a King that conquered death in that resurrection for you. Because of the resurrection, you have a friend in the Holy Spirit that allows you to be in personal relationship with the Holy of Holies, God himself. Because of the resurrection, you have a heavenly shepherd that teaches you his mighty ways and guides you to his righteousness. Because of the resurrection, you have a Messiah that will soon return so that we may be with God forever. Today, tomorrow, each day is your opportunity to know, experience, and grow in your faith of the true God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
who went to Calvary for your sins and rose from the grave to give you hope. I encourage you to seek out God's word in scripture and time and conversation with our Lord for our enduring hope is strengthened in our prayer together. May our prayer and conversation be ever closer as we reflect on this time, as we reflect on the resurrection, that we may be drawn close in prayer and be strengthened in the searching of his word. For the resurrection is not one of a sad story. The, the crucifixion, the Calvary, did not end in a sad way, but ends in hope and in victory. That victory is for you. And we look forward to his return for that victory to be made complete, that we may be forever with him. Amen. Father, 
Glorious is your name. For you came to this earth where we did not deserve to be saved from our sins, but yet your love abounded in our lives, and you sent Christ to take our sins away. And he rose from the grave at your command to give us hope. He is alive. He lives with us, through us, as we share your message of hope and of love with those who have not heard it. So today, this weekend, every day, we take the opportunity to celebrate your resurrection for the hope that it brings that we, lowly humans, have opportunity to be in relationship with you for you have called us your own. We are your people and you are our God. Thank you for that promise, Lord. May we live each day with that thought in mind that you are with us, that you are guiding us, that you love us, that you are alive and is returning soon to be with us, to take us to be with you so that we can experience your fullness in a way that we never have. Lord, we look forward to that day. And until that time, may we sing your praises. May our hearts be filled with the joy that comes, that knowing that that tomb is empty, that those women preached, that the men proclaimed that you have risen and that you live today. Thank you, Father. Please stand. He is free. Please join us for our potluck downstairs. 